I'm going to start with trying, trying something new. And a couple of hours ago, a tweet war, if you like, started out between Elon Musk and Vitalik uh, Buterin. <laughs> it's here on the screen. And uh, Elon is asking, what should be developed on Ethereum? And Vitalik, that's the founder of Ethereum, so that's like Satoshi wow. Nakamoto of Ethereum, uh, says a couple of different ideas. You like this one? Looks great so far. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to list up a couple of them. And I want you to say afterward what you say is your kind of main thing. So from Retalik's list of 11 things, what is your main one? OK? So you need to kind of keep close attention. <laughs> OK. Topics. A global a globally accessible financial system. Two, identity. Sign in with Ethereum instead of sign in with Facebook. Three, all sorts of registries should publish on chain. Four, experimenting with new forms of human organizational structures. Five, all sorts of micropayments, use cases via payment channels. Six, markets for personal data. Seven, crypto economics for preventing, uh, for preventing spam. And this continues here. Clever. Okay. Crypto economics, uh, micro payment schemes to reward publishers. Testing, new, testing ground for new market signs. P2P marketplaces. Identity, reputation, and credit system. And lastly, decentralized DNS, like the ENS. Did you choose one? You're ready to start at one side and go through and say what your main thing is? It's hard. <laughs> I, I, I'm still in shock that this is even happening. <laughs> <laughs> I've been like, whoa, when worlds collide. Uh, if, if you told me three years ago that we were going to wind up with Vitalik and Elon Musk openly discussing the future of the universe on Twitter, ah, <laughs> it's entirely improbable, and I refuse to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna type in your tweets right back from the from Oslo Blockchain Day so that Vitalik <laughs> and Elon Musk is up to date on uh, our thoughts. <laughs> I think that's important. Nice, nice. Wow, yeah, this okay. is amazing. When Vitalik brings out the A game, his stuff is incredibly dense. <laughs> yeah, it's just like tweet length summaries of entire theses. Katie, you wanna head start with picking one? I can, if you want, off the hook. Okay. I, I think for me, the most interesting one that's not on the list, and my friends. Uh, Is that legal? At, yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> that hasn't been mentioned here. Um, and it's probably out of respect for the security people who cringe whenever someone mentions this idea is voting. But, you know, think about the impact around the world of having transparent, authentic, auditable, you know, legitimate elections. You know, think about, you know, all the negative knock-on effects, right, of, of all this election illegitimacy. Um, you, know, you know, accessibility too, right? The fact you can't vote using a mobile device in many countries. I don't know, that's not on the list, but, you know, if the principles of blockchain could be securely applied to voting, huge, huge game changer for the world. Huge one. Perfect. Leo? It has already been done it's in been Norway. In Norway? Yeah, in 2011, 12, 13, and 14, we, we conducted uh, like pilot digital elections in Norway. And uh, the way they handled the anonymous vote with verified identity was deeply inspired by the Bitcoin white paper. Interesting. And there's something going on in Asia, too, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't there? Was it Vietnam or? Yeah. But, yeah. I guess I could so. interject and say that it worries me. Um, Part of Polkadot is to have on-chain voting and on-chain governance. So I'm very much behind this idea of voting and being on-chain. But when you're voting on a blockchain, you're not really voting at the national level. And for the national level and governments, I'm still happy to have everything paper-based. Um, mm. I know people talk about hacking and social hacking and Cambridge Analytica and all that sort of crap. But at the same time, um, I still feel there's less attack vectors for a paper-based vote. Yeah. And mm -hmm. having previously worked in information security, I know there's a shit ton of attack vectors with computers. And so voting was done at the national level electronically, even with a blockchain, it would still worry the hell out of me. I'm not sure we're there yet. Perfect. Yeah. You agree? Yeah, I, 
Charles agrees. In, in principle, uh, yes, <laughs> voting on the blockchain sounds good, but I think the putting this into practice um, won't happen that, because there's going to be too much risk that humans either don't think about or, um, yeah, implementation details that will go away that will make this whole thing collapse and be more corruptible than the existing paper-based system. And in, and in Norway, we did actually not go for the system. It's not, not, now not being used, isn't that No, it's, uh, they didn't carry on after the pilot due to lack of political yeah. will. And mm -hmm. I think also an uh, important factor to mention here is that there is basically uh, the decision makers or the lawmakers doesn't really have a good incentive to want this. John, you need, to, you need to ask Elon whether Elon and Vitalik, whether we'll get to Mars first or have secure electronic Elections. voting, which Good is question. going to happen first. <laughs> Mars. Probably, probably Mars. Surely you, need, mining. surely you need the secure electronic voting for managing and governing your Mars colony. Hmm. I mean, blockchain is how you keep track of like where the wrenches are and how much oxygen is in the tanks hmm. and who's got the right to pull how much power out of the solar panels because it's a dust storm and that stuff is scarce. Right? So, you know, th this looks like the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm um, going to, so for, uh, for me, the really interesting piece is the international aid piece with this kind of technology, especially when you're dealing with high levels of corruption. Um, and the amount of aid that gets lost across borders due to corruption is, is, is huge. I um, appreciate it's a very, like, rosy picture of we want the world to be a better place. But I'm... Um, um, for us, it's a, a big picture is about bridging that gap between humanity and tech. And I, I think this technology does have the um, ability in, in many, many ways to um, enable human beings to be better. Um, and, and for me, that, that international aid piece is, is a really interesting piece. But, but then again, that would just be like, like a result of having, for example, like a global financial system, right? I mean, you would need to have some way to like facilitate mm -hmm. those things. Um, and I mean, so of course, if I had to pick one working at Maker, I would have to pick like global financial system. Probably the same uh, for me. Huh? Yeah, probably the same for me. I mean, because it covers a multitude of sins. Yeah. Um, it, it will be like infrastructure that like a lot of these things would have to be built upon, right? Because I mean, of course, like if you need to deal with like, like aid, for example, and we have, we have had discussions with like some of the largest organizations in the world dealing with these things, such as like the World Bank. But like the whole issue, and it's still that like you can create all these like pilots about like how would we transfer funds, but if the funds you're transferring will not be you know like inherently like better than what we have now, it doesn't matter, right? Because you would still find ways to be able to corrupt it. I don't think it's just about money, though. I think there's there's more to it than sure. just the yeah. financial piece. So um, that there's an organisation out there that um, provides a platform to connect people in those countries that need international aid, that have ideas to fix problems that they have in their countries, to connect them to financial aid, but also to developers, to um, you know advisors, because they don't have the stuff on the ground. So um, yeah, absolutely. That the, sure, but then the, again, they the, would the have to pay those developers. Thing. They would have to pay those people. I mean, money yeah, but, is just like but, a facilitator. Uh, you don't for need everything. a whole new financial system for that, right? Right. You, you need a payment platform ultimately. Um, and so, so that that's just, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's, there's multiple facets to when you talk about international aid, right? Financial services is one small part of it, but there is a, a huge range of things. I, I want to get Sylvia into this discussion also. <laughs> no, uh, I have, thanks. No, I think to me this is a little bit like, uh, first of all, he, you know, he has the opportunity and the, the, the privilege to state so many things. And then <laughs> among some things like completely new organizational structures and new democracy and new economics, he says stickers and badges. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a technology that's almost too powerful because it can be used to too many things. And we sound like those 16 blind people that are trying to describe an elephant. You know, everybody describes the, feed, the, the part that makes sense to them and is especially relevant. And I think blockchain is one of those things um, that AI, if you think about the amount of science fiction that has been written related to AI, it's immense. And we've thought those scenarios really well through for many, many years. With blockchain, there is so little long thinking. You know, it's new. And we're trying to figure it out as we are implementing on the ground. And I think then, the only way to go about figuring out what it really can be useful for is to go Katie's uh, way and let's see what works and let's see what sells and let, you know, without, and, and I think it'll be too slow if we're waiting for the regulators to tell us what's really good or not good and, you know, because, because they are going to just be super risk averse. 
they can't allow themselves to allow technology that, you know, will, well, we saw what happens with, with Trump and, and, and Cambridge Analytica and so on. So everybody who has the right to say no will, by instinct, be super risk averse. And I think we need to figure out who wants this, who wants this now, and start doing it without trying to have some kind of top-down priority list. That makes sense, but still, can you choose what part of that elephant makes most sense to you? <laughs> I, I think it depends on who you are. And, you know, I was on the board of a big international bank, and I wasn't even allowed to touch anything related to this. Uh, so, uh, for very good reasons. You know, so I think we have so many different um, aspects of what's... To me, maybe the decentralized aspect and the transparency smart contracts are the sort of uh, blockchain I like most. But, but I, I think that this is like a really good like, like showcase of like why this is so amazing, right? Because we're like a bunch of people here, and all of us have like widely different like passions and ideas, mm -hmm. like what we think it should be used for. So that also just means like, inst like we cannot really have like a top-down list that's like general for everyone, right? Because all of us are going to put a lot of energy and effort into specific products that make sense for us. So we have like a bunch of like very passionate and driven people driving their own project, how they think it should be done. So whether you focus like, I don't really get what you would focus on, but like whether you focus on like financial inclusion, like financial structures we do, or you're like building out like, like you know, facilities for these local projects to help each other, that actually doesn't really matter too much in the end, right? Because we just have a bunch of people who will like drive their passion out into the world. I, I think I, this is actually like a showcase of like why it's so amazing. Yeah. No, so I, I, I have played with smart contracts and I've been playing with transparency of uh, supply chain and things that can prove, you know, where the product comes from and who's been dealing with it in what way, not just the financial aspects of the value chain, but really the whole story. I, I think those, those things are possible to sell. I've mm -hmm. also been using some of this for, for uh, like real-time audit and, and automation of some of that. I, I think that's amazing. But, but again, I think that um, you're actually right. We should all do the p work on problems that we are really passionate about and then see how this technology can solve them in completely new ways. Now we're going to uh, try to move on to the next question. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, <laughs> this, remind, this reminds me of mid-90s discussions about what the World Wide Web is for. Mm -hmm. I guess so. that same thing of like, yeah. it's for everything, and it turns out to be for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my next question, I'm starting off kind of pessimistic. And I know a lot of you have been in the crypto game for quite a while. Uh, so I was thinking of starting with you, Garrick, but uh, you can all <laughs> jump in. And my question is, what assumptions about blockchain going back to, I don't know when you got in, probably, probably uh, pretty early, but um, what assumptions proved to be wrong? So what things about blockchain you went, aha, this is perfect for X, but it turns out it doesn't work for X at all. I, I still remember Nick Sabo, I think it was, at uh, DEF CON 1, decentralize all the things, right? Well, all the things probably shouldn't be decentralized, right? <laughs> um, and uh, we're in a hybrid kind of world today where we're kind of semi-decentralized with some projects. That's probably the right place to be given the maturity of the technology and where we're at with this grand challenge around governance. You know, the two of the five grand challenges that I put up there that kind of remain for crypto, I think we'll get user experience probably figured out. That's my guess. Scalability, I think we're going to get that figured out. Um, privacy fungibility is going to be kind of an ongoing thing. Um, you know, cat and mouse a bit, right? Um, governance and monetary policy could be the two real persistent challenges that uh, don't really ever go away, and they're interlinked. Uh, monetary policy has a political nature to it, and, uh, you know, I just, you know, politics change. And, and, you know, are we ever going to come up with a perfect governance model so that we can decentralize all the things? A bit skeptical, frankly. Anyone uh, else want to jump in on that? I mean, for, for me, the most shocking thing is just how completely disorganized the space still is. You know, you kind of had this feeling that it was going to be a bit of, you know, winner takes all. You'd see some enormous Linux-like platform project. All kinds of things would get built on top of that. Um, and, you know, you'd sort of see it sort of stabilized to some degree. But instead, it's not stabilizing. It's accelerating. You know, you've got things like Ethereum, which is beginning to look distinctly retro. You've got all these crazy new, you know, ZK Snark-based things, which is zooming around. You've got players like Telegram and Facebook making noises. 
you've got stuff like this Elon Musk insanity up here. Um, you know, it, it, it just seems to be accelerating. We thought that we were kind of at the point where the story would begin to make sense and there would be convergence. And instead, it's just ships shooting off in all kinds of different directions at half the speed of light. And nobody can make any sense or build a grand narrative around it because it's just all bouncing off the walls at crazy angles. Like, you know, how long before we see a government roll over and just be like, right, our official currency is Bitcoin, two years? Right? And that'll probably happen like right about the same time as Facebook launches its own world currency. And, you know, it's, just, it, it's almost like listing off plots for Bond movies. <laughs> and anyway, they, they're all, they all look equally likely to me. I think we're at this kind of all-time low of predictability in the space. Uh, and I find that completely surprising. Like, I really thought that it was going to settle down some. It's the opposite of what's happening. Mm. Yeah. If there's one thing that um, you know, we assumed when we entered this space, I'm talking as, as opera, and you know, we, we thought that, okay, this, this must have... This must be organized somewhat, and this must be mature, and there must be standards, and the, the APIs must be well defined, and all that. And when we actually started building on top of these things, like we realized that okay, it's, this is <laughs> this is pretty wild, and yeah, no one no one owns it, no one's you know dictating exactly how things should evolve, and that's also you know a reason why we are we're investing so much in this is that we we see an opportunity to to help define this uh, a bit like how we help to find, for example, the HTML5 web standards and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, not as mature as we'd expected. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I guess most of you today now heard the term crypto winter. Has everybody heard it? I'm just going to go with yes. So, it's been <laughs> mentioned several times in several talks, and it's, the, the, it's pretty much uh, about the prices going uh, to shit. And uh, uh, my question to you is, uh, Looking, not looking at the prices. Have you felt this crypto winter, winter in your uh, business, either if that's Oprah or AI or investments or MakerDAO and so on, or is the crypto winter only in the, uh, the prices? I, I, I'm going to jump in because I'm probably the least likely one to jump in here. Um, yes, but in a positive way for us. Um, so I think it's the, the crypto winter to a certain extent has helped shift the conversation from cryptocurrencies to mm -hmm. what are the other applications for the technology? What else can we do with this? Um, which has definitely been um, a positive for us um, as an investor. Um, you know, all VCs have their eyes on the crypto market. If they say they don't, they're lying because we're all thinking about how is this going to disrupt our business models and what's going on out there. Um, but um, ultimately, I think if you look at, look at it from a pure technology standpoint for us, it's actually shifted the conversation quicker um, because people are trying to figure out square peg round hole, like I said before, but are trying to figure out what now, what else can you do with this tech? Whilst this one isn't working, let's find something else to do. So um, yeah, for us, it's definitely been a positive shift. Mm. It's, it's been a bit of a mix. Um, that was actually gonna be my answer to the previous question. What's the biggest thing that's kind of shocked me in its price? So I came across Bitcoin in 2011, hiding in my bedroom. I never spoke about it. I didn't really tell anyone about it. And back then, Bitcoin wasn't even 30 bucks. And the idea was that you could use Bitcoin to pay for things. And it was this whole new economy, which was completely parallel to the real economy. Uh, and obviously, that was very naive. And so whenever Bitcoin hit 100 bucks, and then 1,000 bucks, and then 20,000 bucks, it was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. It was meant to be this whole new parallel economy. So for me, that was probably the biggest shock. And that was my answer to the previous question. Um, and now here, um, in crypto winter, uh, we at the Web3 Foundation have been reasonably well insulated. Uh, we raised a bunch of money at the end of 2017. Uh, we were hiring and growing our team through 2018. Uh, at the moment, we're like 30 people. We grew uh, reasonably quick, I guess, but we didn't grow so quickly because some other teams where they've had to now fire a lot of people. So, and to that extent, it's a very positive story. Um, our technology partner, Parity in Berlin, have also been hiring through um, all of 2018, now into 2019. So it's definitely a positive story. Um, they've been building hard with Substrate and, and Polkadot, um, which is all positive. I, the, I guess what um, I do wonder with the crypto winter is how many more people could have joined, could have maybe been hired if the market was still racing ahead, if more money had come in, or how many more people might I have met today or at a previous conference or at another meetup. And I remember being in London, I used to live there, and we had some really wild, uh, not in the party sense, but, you know, lots of 
co- like meetups like almost like every evening in, in London. And some of the random people that would turn up and start talking about it, it's like, yeah, I heard about this this morning and I thought I'd just turn up. And they randomly turn up to like some meetup at a hotel and start seeing how they think that, um, yeah, uh, Bitcoin or blockchain could be great for the gypsy community. It could be true, I don't know. Um, that was his view and he just started talking and... Uh, mm-hmm. In some ways, that was quite fun just to meet some really random people. Whereas now in 2018 and at meetups, and now in 2019, a lot of people have just disappeared. Um, and I, I, it's it's Sorry. kind of counterfactual to say what might have happened if they had been here. But it would have been nice, perhaps, to think about if they had been here. Uh, each of these meetups now, maybe there could have been better adoption or but more. How, how is it possible for Parity and Polkadot to grow when most of your money, I'm guessing, is coming from Ether? from people who are investing early in Polkadot? Um, I mean, that's probably one for the finance team. Um, I think some of the money which was collected, or a decent chunk of it, was cashed out. Uh, and then it's kind of burning through the cash. So obviously that's not sustainable. But we have some ideas around sustainability and longevity. Uh, Parity is a bit of a different case because they can essentially uh, get money from different foundations or different companies to help them, say, like enterprises like Microsoft or whoever, Siemens. Uh, at the foundation hours is different. We raised a bunch of money, and we, when we have this launch of Polkadot, we will have an amount of tokens kept over for the foundation, which, again, is another finite supply of tokens, which hopefully has some economic value that we can sell. And at some point, that may run out. Mm. Uh, and then so we have to kind of scratch our heads and think, okay, does it make sense either to shut down the foundation or... Do we still want to try and execute upon our vision? And then for what should we do? And I think we're, within our kind of our projections, we're probably good for another at least three years, maybe five years. Uh, if, depending how the market goes, it could be 10 years. So I wouldn't want to say too much more beyond that. Sylvia? So <clears throat> I don't know if I'm answering actually the previous question about what we were wrong about or, or, or the, the winter question. When, when it comes to the winter question, I. You know, I think weather patterns, stable, regular weather patterns, occur when you have regularity, when you have stability. And as Vinay said, we are so far from having any stability in what this thing is. So this is more like talking about winter when the world, you know, when the Earth is still a mass of magma, and there are storms, and we're trying to figure out where the continents are going to end up. So. You know, we, we don't know, and I think it's in the making of concrete projects and products that we're going to get to some sort of geography and then to some sort of weather patterns as well. And I believe that we've been looking too much at the financial systems. I think thinking about global transparent financial systems is something that's really difficult because every nation... The world, you know, the future is not only global, it's also local, because I think we humans are social animals at a local level. And I think envisioning a future where there is some sort of global control of every economy in some sort of harmonious system is impossible. That's not how history and politics work. And so I think every country and every you know, tribe will want to have some control over their financial future. And you know, Vitalik is not going to be able to duct- dictate that for the rest of the world. So I think more along the lines of identity, the projects that Katie was talking about, the, you, know, you, you were talking about these whales. I mean, I, I understand why politicians would be skeptical and still we, are, we should be really impressed by po- politicians that use this Silicon Valley language to start thinking about cryptocurrencies and regulation and so on. So I think, I, I don't know whether it's winter just for the price of cryptocurrency and, you know, full storm for every other application of blockchain and we should perhaps be celebrating all the other storms and seeing where they take us. Yeah, but I mean, like the reason why it's called the window, right, is because like so many people got fired, so many projects shut down, right? So I mean, but, it's, it's like very apparent that like even though the projects, I agree, like, I, like from my perspective, handling partnerships, it's much easier now for me to kind of like vet the teams because there's not this like much noise anymore. So usually the ones that get like left behind now is usually like projects that are doing something right because they still, you know, either manage their fund really well or like are doing something that actually like still pays them now. Um, but but still there's like so many projects that, that got discarded, right? Yeah, but, but I, I'll, I I'll just... Say, sorry, I was going to say that the reason that we've seen a lot drop off is because they, they weren't... There was, no, there was no sustainability behind them. There was no longevity to what they were doing. You know, the whole ICO market and cryptocurrency market, different things, don't get me wrong, but 
that 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 whole bubble, you know, we saw ridiculous things get funded that should never have got funded in the first place, right? So I think we've seen a clear out. Like you see a lot of the time with, yep. with, with our hype curves, you see a clear out of the, excuse my language, crap that's out there. And then you get those proper companies that, are, that have longevity and have a sustainable business model that rise to the surface. And they're the ones that ultimately help stabilize the weather, right? That, yeah. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, sure. I mean, I completely agree. I mean, and like, so at Maker, we are probably one of the companies that hired the most during 2018. We went from around 20 people, then we are 100 and, 100 and something, like 102 or something today. So we have, like, you know, like, like uh, multiplied uh, our people a lot throughout 2018. Um, but so I'm not speaking of this kind of like a defending us, but more just like coming from a position where like, even though a lot of the projects like probably didn't work out because they didn't have anything sustainable, but there was also just like a lot of the stuff that were just like very ambitious and like needed the amount of funding they got during like the craze, right? And of course, if you set your business plan from the money you got back then and you don't change into fiat or you expect that, you know, the price will keep on rising, I mean, you're going to end up being bankrupt. So I actually think like some of the projects that didn't turn out to something actually like probably could have been to something if they kept having that money. But I agree like that was of course like completely unsustainable. Mm. Um, but we, we had a lot of talent in those companies as well. So I mean for us for example like we got so much good talent in from companies yeah. that fired a lot of people. So I think like, like you know putting everything into like the bad ICO box is something that's a little bit dangerous because of course like a lot of companies just, just, just took the opportunity right. So just because like someone like went along with the craze doesn't necessarily make them like bad or like having like a bad project, but they just gave in to what the market conditions were at that time. Yeah. I just want to just add one outsider perspective that we heard uh, from you know institutions, sign it with individuals who are kind of looking at the space, interested, but they're watching th watching things like the the the, the Ethereum flippening or you know all the you know uncertainty around what's even going to be around. Um, you know, some uh, people want this space to be a little simpler, a little more predictable. It's going to make them feel more comfortable coming into the space. You know, is Bitcoin going to be around in 10 years? Is Ethereum going to be around in 10 years? If I'm confident that that you know, one or both are going to be there, I'm much more likely to want to add digital assets to my portfolio. Um, and things like, you know, getting an ETF, getting Ethereum futures, these are all things that capital that's not come into the space yet is kind of waiting for. And having also all this brain power, I think, concentrated on fewer projects, there's some benefits to that too. Now, I've pushed back against institutional investors who are arguing against things like Grin. They don't like seeing that. I'm like, no, no, you need this experimentation. It's still very magma state. You know, we, we need, you know, it's, we're not, you know, so advanced that you can't have things like Mimble Wimble experimented on. You should, you should do that. Um, but there is that view for institutions that the simpler the space gets, the better, and the more comfortable we're going to get getting into it. So I'm going to... Uh, I just want to say one thing on this. So, I mean, for us, right, it, fundraising has been hell, right? Mm. Because Materium is, you know, heavily, heavily, heavily dominated by lawyers. We're about 50% lawyers <laughs> and technical people. Uh, we didn't go anywhere near the ICO markets because our lawyers were just like, let me tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> and most of it has. Um, but for the people that played it straight, didn't do ICOs, uh, and were doing deep tech development, it's become super hard to raise funds. So I think we're in a position now where the players that either rolled the dice and are in the firing line for the SEC but may never got hit or found sustainable business models early, that stuff is working great. Um, you know, I feel like we've got a whole bunch of pirate Xerox parks, like status, right? They're raising an enormous amount of money. They're sitting there building phenomenal code. Um, but what I'm seeing is a huge slowdown in innovation because you can no longer find crazy money to do crazy things. And the VCs have moved into the space in a really huge way. Um, and if you want another replica of Silicon Valley, having the show run by VCs is a sure way to get it. Because venture capital is extremely conservative in a way that the ICO markets weren't. You know, I kind of feel like it's a shame that we didn't find a properly regulated vehicle that allowed for small investors to get involved in financing technology, but that didn't permit kind of ICO abuses. So this is my second to last question. And then there's an after party at the blockchainers office. Mm. Uh, and that is, uh, you already, already started saying it, uh, Rene, uh, when, uh, when the web came, uh, we started thinking about all the possibilities. And uh, a lot of thought went into, now this opens up for new business models. Uh, you can move away from 
advertising on radio and TV to something else, something new, maybe something more democratic, some, something that makes more sense. But what we ended up with is Identity by Facebook, funded by advertising. It's Google, funded by advertising. And it's the same revenue model, right, being used again. So going into the Web 3.0, if you like, using blockchain for uh, web services. We see the same hype, and maybe this will open up new business models. Will it, or will it not? Well, there's hope, because you know, if you think of just the open financial or system and, and payment side of things, um, that capability has been missing from the web all along, and they had to create these alternative systems to capture value and sort of keep keep these sites running like Facebook, like Google. So now that we, with this technology, we have this built-in cap payment capability where you know, now you can transfer value back and forth between users and applications. I think there's, now we have a chance of, that these new models can emerge. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah, I, I would, um... So I'm not coming from a point of um, actually knowing because most of our investments are pretty much B2B SaaS business models, even though they're using blockchain technology. Um, but I would say that um, from an investor perspective, that um, if we truly want to innovate, then we cannot base every investment decision on what has already been, right? So we have a tendency to go, right, do they do that? Is, is there something else similar to what they're doing already that's worked for us to be able to validate that that's going to work again? Um, and, and, you know, if we truly want to fund new innovative ideas, maybe not huge amounts of money like, like we did see in the past, but um, some sort of funding, then we do need to think outside of the box. And I don't know the answer to that, if I'm being really honest with you. We're always looking at for what's out there from a new business model perspective because we haven't seen any real success yet. Bear in mind, I realize I'm just saying I'm going against what I've just said. But um, for us, it's um, trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, and then to trying to get some real traction in market with a new type of business model, because that's what we're struggling with, right? We don't have any examples to go on, and so people fear what they don't know. Um, and investors are the worst, like you say. I, I agree, yeah. but how are you on time, Katie? Fine, I, I need to shoot. That was, that, that was my last thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. No, we have time with the plane. <laughs> You're off. Yeah, yeah, okay. I need to uh, run now. I think uh, blockchain technology as uh, infrastructure of trust might uh, bring some real uh, change in business models uh, simply and especially like the collaborative uh, way of operating and because if we see today we have a lot of these really expensive multi-sourcing models that cost a lot to keep up and running. And uh, I think basically it, uh, blockchain technology might be a driver and make it's going to make it simpler to innovate. On, yeah, simpler uh, to trust. Uh, yeah. 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 And w once you have this trust, I think collaboration yeah. comes from that. Yeah. Yeah, but, but also just uh, like so many things today is just by default interoperable, right? Like, I mean, I, I deal with partnerships at, at Maker, and, you know, we have, like, over 200 partnerships now. And that's because it's so easy to integrate, like, on one way or each other, because all these, like, different formats just, like, fit nicely together. Uh, and that's, that's also something that, you know, that really, really makes it easy just to, like, expand this ecosystem so fast, right? Because if you develop at, at DAP, you can very easily get some of the things that was very difficult to get before, which is, you know, like, infrastructure and, like, access and, like, you know, joining, like, an ecosystem. Um, so I definitely think that, you know, like, just, and, and, and then also just being able to capture value on the token level, I think is something that also creates just like inherently like new business models, because you can monetize in a completely different way. And you can also, and that monetization, instead of having that go to, you know, like the equity level or like give that back to the VCs, you can actually pay, give it back to like the users of your platform. Uh, and that's something that, you know, and for example, when we get... That's good exactly, Gary. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, I just would say, I mean, you know, I, just because we don't necessarily come up with radically new business models, we shouldn't, um, you know, celebrate the improved, you know, or tweaked, slightly tweaked business model. So, for example, I'm going to give a commercial, you know, our company blockchain um, introduced a swap feature where our users can swap crypto assets in a non-custodial way. And I hope the maker guys don't mind my... Um, 
uh, picking on Tether, uh, <laughs> but Tether had a problem recently uh, out of New York, and you know what? That looks a lot like uh, what happened with MF Global and John Corzine, the former senator, former head of Goldman Sachs, who took customer money at MF Global and speculated on European debt, unbeknownst to his customers. You know, um, looks like you know something may have happened. You know, in the crypto space, that's not so different from what happened in traditional finance with non-custodial. Uh, solutions, that's simply not possible. You know, we cannot do that. We cannot take our customers' coins and go speculate or do something with them unbeknownst to them. So it's, it's still, there's a transaction fee, not a different business model, but it's a, it's a new way of doing that, new way to make money, uh, you know, facilitating exchange in a trust-minimized way. I think that's something we should celebrate hmm. as an improvement. Edward? Yeah, um, yeah kind of echoing that, that thought. Um, even if we don't see truly new business models, if we want to be really cynical, we could say, yeah, we've seen it all before, but maybe we can see at least improvements upon what's been before. So that's one thing. The other thing was, um, I think now with blockchain, it's much easier to actually make money with an open source product. So when it's open source, it's essentially free. Um, okay, you could maybe dig into the details of the, of the license and say it, but it's not, or whatever. But I think that's pretty hard. You know, Red Hat has maybe made money, has been one of the few that I can think of off the top of my head that's been around for a while and has made money with an open source product. Uh, I can't think of too many others. Maybe there is. Maybe the rest of the panel know of open source uh, projects or products which have somehow made money for, like, the parent company. Now with blockchain, it seems that actually you can now monetize code which is open source. Mm. And is is that a new business model? Maybe not. It, maybe it's a, just a new way you're selling a product at the end of the day, or rather you're selling a service because your product is free. And I think na my naive view is the world's going to move towards it, at least in the West, that will be more about open source products and more about providing services, high quality services, either for integration um, or just somehow providing some sort of service level agreement where you guarantee some sort of uptime or, mm. or whatever. Um, I think that's kind of the direction. The other one was actually uh, Vinny's project, Vinny. Um, I, I, uh, to kind of shell him a bit, I think there is something really interesting there. If you can own some physical asset through some sort of smart contract, maybe you own like one tenth of a bicycle or one hundred millionth of a Stradivarius violin. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. even looking. And then you use that as collateral in the mega system, right? <laughs> and then you can, you know, buy and sell Dai or, you know, Zcash, you know, or whatever. I think, I think that's going to be pretty revolutionary that things can be more liquid uh, in a good way. Um, things like liquid um, collateral uh, has, has, was talked about on Twitter, and that does make me a little bit worried when something's collateral. Maybe it doesn't need to be super liquid. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, being able to kind of, I don't want to use the word democratize because it sounds a little bit kind of cheesy, but making it more accessible for yeah. just general people to then own like some fraction of a big building mm. right now as, as, as a, someone who kind of graduated uh, with a PhD after the recent financial crisis, it's been really hard to say buy a house or an apartment. In the last two places I've lived in, one in Zug now in Switzerland, I have no chance. And where I lived in London, pretty much no chance. Um, I, I just want to say one thing. This fractionalization, this securitization, this goes back 40 years to Louis Ranieri inventing the mortgage-backed security at Solomon Brothers way back 40 years ago. So fractionalized home equity sure. ownership, it's just an extension of that. Using a blockchain is an extension sure. of that. So sure. how different is it? In some sure. ways, not so much, but boy, if you yeah, can fractionalize we, home equity, and we that seen could it in be London, pretty, pretty cool. Even right now, even without blockchain. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. somehow the blockchain, I think, would enhance that. So it's, yeah, we've seen it before, but yep. this I mean, will be enhanced. I've got to say here that, I mean, with all this stuff, to be honest, I don't give a monkey's about tokenization, right? I mean, we've got perfectly effective ways of tokenizing things already. It's called equity, right? Anybody that wants to buy real estate in London in, you know, the form of shares inside of, uh, uh, what are those things called? Real estate investment trusts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, that's a really well-established category of businesses. There are millions of them out there. Dramatically cutting the transaction costs might have some interesting effects, but the fundamental driver for this is still securities fraud, right? Everybody that's running around tokenizing real estate expects to be selling these tokens to the general public, and there's no doubt where they're going to be able to do that, at least in America, and it's unlikely in Europe, it's very unlikely in China. So I think that there's still a fundamental naivety about what the regulators really want out of these situations, yep. because the last thing that they want to see is an enormous property bubble based on people putting tokenized equity onto, you know, secondary markets for, you know, the, the great new, you know, pile of buildings in Shenzhen or whatever it is they're going to do. Like, 
if we are only going to be able to sell these things to accredited investors, the market is not going to dramatically transform because we already have those people. Right? The place where I think the pay dirt is, is supply chain. Right? I mean, the, the, the basic machinery of industrial capitalism is incredibly poorly organized. The software is horrendous. Anybody that's ever worked with ERP knows that. Um, so I think the, the real efficiency gains are, you know, 10% of the world's assets are permanently underutilized. It's $120 trillion of assets. I don't even know how you account that high. Um, and, you know, th those are markets where the problems are very clear and you can see where the damage is. Whereas simply making real estate speculation easier, I'm just not seeing where the profit is in that. So, so my, my, my last question, uh, and we have to be quick on this one. That is, if we are here sitting down now and thinking, I believe in the changes that blockchain can bring, I buy into it, what can you do? What is your call to action uh, for taking, taking it into your organization or at a private level to kind of help and co contribute if you believe that this is a technology that should be more used? Um, your call to action. So we, <laughs> there's three ways. I think the best way to get people exposed to blockchain technology is to actually use crypto, uh, to actually touch it, you know. <laughs> um, how do you do that? If you're in Vietnam, you don't have any money, you don't have a bank account, are you going to start mining it? No. Are you going to buy it? Of course not. You don't even have a bank account. You know, you may need to have a way, if you did, if you have a bank account, to get it connected to an exchange. So, you know, I, you know, again, there's bit of a mixed reputation around this, but I'm a big believer in giving away crypto. You know, we're running a huge airdrop with, with Stellar XLM, 125 billion of blockchain. It's a great way to get this into the hands of people who have never used crypto before and get them using it. My mom, for the first time, actually now holds some crypto, um, you know, because of airdrop. So this is a great way to get people um, doing this. And Stellar's got one going with Coinbase as well now. Um, more giving it away, I think, is going to be needed, frankly, to onboard a lot more people. So uh, Garrick's going to be on the after party and uh, <laughs> giving out the Ether and other uh, Bitcoins. <laughs> is there anyone else with a call to action? Or is that the one, owning crypto? <laughs> <laughs> so i, I, I got to say here that I think we all need to be keeping a super close eye on Telegram. Right? I mean, they've got a quarter of a billion users and they're rolling out a smart contract platform this year, and they've got a billion dollar of war chest funded by VCs. That's a hundred times more user than, users than Bitcoin has ever seen. It's gigantic. Uh, and I just have this kind of feeling that, you know, we could turn around one day and discover that we were all gopher, and that they were just launched the web. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that the swinging has even really started yet. We're still in the prehistory, and I think it's incumbent on all of the early actors in the space to keep their wits about them, because enormously powerful forces are moving into the space. Microsoft has been really conservative so far. That might not stay that way. Google, Amazon, dead zip silence. We'll see where they go. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that we need to remember that we are, you know, we, we are still very small in a very large ecosystem, and we're not the only people that can write code. So I think agility and flexibility of mind are extremely important here. Charles? No? I, don't know, I think it's very difficult to kind of like say like a call for action, right? Because I think this is something that, you know, of course it needs to be driven by like an interest, a desire to discover these things yourself. Um, but if you have that and you're in a company and you're like in a position where you feel you can influence some kind of like sway, then, you know, like, like just like figure out like what, what is some of the pain points you have? What are some of the things that you, know, you don't like about like, how things are structured right now? And then, I mean, there is a lot of solutions out there. I mean, even being able to convince your company to do like a POC actually usually helps quite a bit. I mean, we, we have done like a lot of like POCs uh, also with like banks, you know, like for showing them how to transfer funds like outside of the SWIFT system and just in general like doing a lot of these things where we can actually like show like how much money is being saved. And we don't expect to have like a fully functioning application with a bank within, you know, like the next year or two. But we're happy to do these, these things because just like spreading awareness into like these organizations and systems. And then, you know, like I also think like right now the technology is still relatively early. So we actually are still missing like so many pieces of the puzzle, just like when we go out and talk to institutional <laughs> partners. Um, but, but I think that if you do that now and then like when the technology really like hits the spot where it really like, you know, will thrive in an organization, it's much easier to push through, right? I mean, I have so many relationships with companies I don't expect to work with within like the next two years. 
but I know that if we, if we talk with them now and we open the conversation now, then when we get like that technology in hand where we just like, this is what they need. We already had the conversation. They already kind of like know, know the drill, right? And then it's much easier to push through. But kind of like going around and just like waiting, just like it actually doesn't benefit yeah. anything because it'll just be so much harder when you get there to push it through again. Yeah. I think we all want mainstream adoption and, uh, you know, seeing things like what Maker's doing, you know, it's, it's, it's cool, that's great. Um, <clears throat> Uh, doing just more experimenting, more tinkering, just building awareness. So if we go out and just tell people about what's going on and happening, and it's easy to say. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily one thing that you can do, just kind of keep building. Uh, you know, in parity, they're building technology, which is really important, it's infrastructure, but it's kind of boring in many ways. Um, the real sexy stuff is the applications, but someone has to build the boring stuff, and they've got to build it well. Um, and, and that's what we're doing. You know, obviously, our view is uh, to make blockchain development as easy as possible, such that more developers can come into the space and start tinkering, start trying to build blockchains which are really tailored to their business problem. And that maybe doesn't sound super interesting, but hopefully to a developer or to some business leaders, like, ah, you know what, I like this blockchain technology, but I don't really know where to get started. You know, there's such a, you know, a threshold, such a barrier to overcome, you know, that I have to understand. Maybe if there was some product that we could just download and kind of get going with, and that's kind of our review, um, so get the developers in the door first, get them building cool shit. Uh, if they fail, that's fine, they fail, um, but there will be success stories as well, and there will be successful developers, and then hopefully once you've got the developers building cool stuff, then the users come. I mean, I know it sounds slightly naive, but that's, we kind of got to hope that that's, that's what's going to happen. Ending on that note, uh, if you want to do thump something with blockchain, uh, I would urge you to contact me or Blockchangers. Uh, we have done work with Konosun Magistana and uh, Ubos, which you heard here today. Uh, now we're going to continue. Uh, I know you have husbands and uh, children at home, but we want you to follow us. To It's a five-minute walk over to our office where we have beers and drinks and water and whatever, uh, pizzas. And um, yeah, I hope to see most of you there. I want to thank the panel. Thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. And I want to thank all the speakers and all of the volunteers who have made this day possible. And I want to thank all of you who have joined this day and been here for this long. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>